Good evening, everyone. Thanks again for joining us tonight. Uh, tonight is going to be the last teaching that we have in this Eastertide series in the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, if you count the Beatitudes throughout the season of Lent, we have been in this particular teaching from Jesus for like four months or something, which is, I'm pretty sure, a record for our little church. We typically bounce around to different topics and texts, and this has a, been a long stretch for us. But I'm really glad that you've stuck with us, and I hope that you've gained as much from it as I have. I found it to be an extremely important series um, for my my own personal life. Um, tonight we're going to be in, in towards the end of this teaching from Jesus, and we're going to be in a text that you're probably going to find somewhat familiar. Even if you haven't been in church world for very long, you're totally new to this Christianity thing, you're going to hear something tonight that you've probably heard before. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 7, and it goes like this. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks the door will be opened. Which of you, if your son asks for bread, gives him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you, then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? So in everything, do to others as you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, the didactic crux of this particular teaching from Jesus is the rhetorical question right in the middle, I think. Jesus was no middle-of-the-road, ordinary orator. He was actually really skilled in what he did. Um, He was able to uh, make something personal, uh, even though the topic itself might have been general. He was able to draw a crowd and to hang on to that crowd for an extended period of time. He was able to say things that felt really personal and really important, even if those people had never met him before. This particular tactic that he uses here, the rhetorical question, I think was meant to be amusing. If you kind of get an image in your mind of what he's describing, uh, a parent um, offering a snake to a child who has asked for a fish, that could have been amusing depending on its delivery. And I think it adds an important amount of levity that might be missed uh, due to the gravity of the rest of the passage. And, and, and it's one of the great examples of Jesus's incredible ability to teach. This question would have made its point to just about anybody. Even me, a a fairly dense and and rather immature father, can understand what this question means. But truth be told, if I was standing there that day and listening to Jesus teach, I might have been the idiot that raised my hand. If he says, who of you would give to your child a snake when they ask for a fish? I might have been the guy who was like, actually, I I would have done that. That would have been something that I would have found really, really funny because I find it amusing to kind of pick on my kids, to troll my kids a little bit. And by a little bit, I mean a lot of it. In fact, I do it so often that at this point, when I say things to them, they typically look directly at another adult to see if whatever I've said is true which means I have them exactly where I want them, frankly. Uh, This is going a little bit too far, though, um, because I think that now I've started to do this to other people's kids. Um, Just the other day, we were eating dinner, and Mia kept coming up to the table and grabbing chips from in front of me and eating them out of a bowl. I was giving her a hard time as if this was unacceptable and these were my chips and she couldn't have any, but any of them, which of course wasn't true. But her cousin got caught onto the idea and started to come up and eat food off of our table as well. And I instinctively, without thinking at all, lightly tapped her hand and looked at her deadpan and said, those are my chips, you can't have any of those. She looked at me incredulous and then immediately looked at her dad like, why have you not punched this guy yet? Which I totally would have deserved. So I need to scale back on some of the snake instead of a fish sort of interaction with my kids. But even to a dense and immature father like myself, I can understand the question that Jesus is asking here. Even to this rhetorical question, I can understand that Jesus is making a point about a father giving good gifts to his children. A father, a parent, a father figure giving good gifts to their children when they want those things. You see, those gifts are are for them, for their good. Even if they're... um, those things are things that they want and maybe not things that they need. As long as they're good for that child or those things are benign, at least to that child, a father wants to give good gifts to their kids. Now, you may be like me and and that teaching itself, that idea about God might be a little bit foreign to you. I'm not sure where we got it in our head, but several people in our church, myself included, somewhere along the way picked up on this idea that God is some sort of distant dictator, not an intimate father who wants to give good gifts to his children. And unfortunately, that's affected the way that we live our lives. It's affected the way we treat other people. It's affected the way that we interact with God. It's affected the way we understand 
ourselves. I'm not sure where it came from, like I said, but in reality, this is the personality of God. And I think it's the first teaching that Jesus gives us in this really short text. The personality of God is to be a father who gives good gifts. It's something our church is getting used to, but there are a handful of people in our church. There are a few people that continue to encourage us to ask with courage and to ask with some level of audacity. There's a handful of people in our church that believe this so much so that they're willing to ask God for all kinds of wild things. And they've taught people like me and some of you as well to ask God for things as if you're a child asking your father for something. Um, it, you, many of you haven't actually seen this yet, but you've certainly heard of it because we talk about it all the time. We do have a new parking lot and patio right outside of this building. And we're going to continue to talk about it because it's a really exciting thing. I mean, the thing that was out there before was this abysmal black hole. It was like this terrible crater of a thing. And since it's not that bad anymore, um, I can continue to embellish the story and make it sound way worse than it actually was because honestly, it just makes the new one seem even better and nobody can prove me wrong. But in reality, there was just a really bad parking lot, kind of like a gravel pit out there. And now there's something else there. And many of you contributed to that project and many of you gave financially and sacrificially to that. But what you may not know is that for a year leading up to that project, um, the parish pastors and our executive director would stand out in that lot every Wednesday, this terrible swamp with snakes and alligators. It was a horrible place. We'd stand there knee deep in this muck and we would ask God for a new lot. We, we kept asking him to give this good gift to us. And we did that for a few reasons. One, we believed that it was the best way to steward this building and this property, but we also believed that it could be a great gift to this community. Sometimes when the Father gives us good gifts, we get to continue to re-gift those and give those things to other people. And in a kind of densely populated urban area like this, parking is a hot commodity. It's something that's disappearing seemingly by the day. To be able to give this to our neighborhood was a huge thing. So as God was generous towards us, we were able to be generous to the community. This is the personality of God. And it's why we say in our generosity prayer every week that we want to be generous as our father is generous and show the world what he is like as his daughters and sons, as his children. The personality of God is to give good gifts to his children. Even if we think that he's some distant dictator, that simply isn't true according to this teaching from Jesus. The second thing that we see in this text from Jesus is our position toward God. So the first thing is God's personality towards us. Then our position towards him is one of a child to a father. Um, Now, this is metaphorical language. Kevin mentioned this a couple of weeks ago, that um, this this language about us being a child to a father, we're not actually the, like, genetic material of God, although some would like to make that argument, and some probably can make that argument. I think that sometimes when we overlook and maybe even explain away the metaphorical and literary language of the Bible, we miss some of the beauty of what it's getting at. But we are like children to this God who is like a father to us. Now, this is both humbling and it's comforting, if you think about it, right? Because it's humbling because when, when we are a child, we are dependent on our parents. Now, a lot of kids come into our home and your home and other homes like ours because they were not able to get the care that they need from the parents that they had prior. That doesn't mean these parents were monstrous or terrible people. A lot of these parents who lose custody of their kids were, had fallen on difficult times, the likes of which I cannot even begin to imagine. And because of that, they haven't been able to care for their children, and those children end up in my home or your home or homes like ours. Um, About a month before we launched this church, this little boy, he was a little over one years old, um, and his name was Carlos. He moved into our home with about an hour's notice, and he came with absolutely nothing. Um, He was wearing uh, a T-shirt and a diaper. Uh, He had a teddy bear, and he had a bottle with some questionable milk in it, and that was really all that he had. And our responsibility at the very moment of meeting him was to care for him and to give him the sort of gifts that caring parents would give to him, to give to him the kind of things, material or otherwise, that he needed in order to grow and to develop. That is the role of a parent to a child. The role of a child to a parent is like Carlos's role to us. There was nothing he could really do to provide for himself. It's a very humbling thing to think of yourself as somebody who doesn't have anything to contribute to your well-being or to contribute to what you have. God is the primary one who's responsible for for, uh, caring for you. That's the comforting piece. It's humbling in one way, but it's comforting in another. 
Now, it doesn't mean that we like wait for God to deliver groceries to our door or go to go get that job that we need to get or that kind of thing. What it means is that rather we partner with God in getting things done in our lives, but God is primarily responsible for that thing. And that means that God sees us in a deep, loving way, in, in a way that only a parent can see a child, in a way that it is hard to describe. Uh, Rob Reamer describes it like this. If you believe the things that God believes about you, it would revive your soul. And I believe that to be true, honestly. If you, if you could like start to get your mind and your heart around this idea of being a child of God, I think it could completely revolutionize your life, your faith, your relationships, pretty much everything. But to be a child of God is both humbling and comforting. This is our position toward God. This is the teaching of Jesus, that we are in fact in a situation wherein we are dependent upon God. Humbling and comforting as it may be, we are children of God. Lastly, in this teaching, uh, we see this little bit about our posture towards other people. Now, this is referred to oftentimes as the golden rule, right? Like treat others as you would have them treat you. It's a well-known teaching. It's a well-known mantra. It's known among Christians, but it's also well-known among non-Christians. So um, Christian or people who aren't Christians, people who really have never darkened the door of a church or cracked a Bible, know a few things from the Sermon on the Mount. Turn the other cheek, love your enemy, uh, treat others as you would have them treat you. Frankly, the things that are most difficult for Christians to actually accomplish are the very things that people tend to know about us um, because they know that these are things that we are to aspire to and strive for even if we fail in doing so. And so this golden rule is presented to us. But what Jesus says here could easily be missed if we're not careful with the context of the passage. If you think about everything that Jesus has said, it adds and sheds important light on what he means by the golden rule. You see, To love your neighbor as yourself, to love other people the way you would want them to love you or to treat you is actually more of a posture than it is a task. We make interactions with people a task a lot of times, right? Like we think about, okay, this person's walking up to me or I'm going to interact with this person later today. How am I going to approach them? And if we're honest, every time we approach a relationship or an interaction that way, it completely exhausts us. When we approach people as a task to accomplish, it's not only impossible, but it's terribly exhausting. Rather, when we present ourselves to every single person with the same consistent posture, the posture that God has instilled in us as his children, um, it changes every interaction that we have for the better. I want you to think just for a second about your neighbors, okay? Think about, and I mean your literal, literal neighbors, think about the people you share either a property line with or a wall with, okay? Imagine their faces, maybe their names. Imagine their situation, maybe the last interaction you had with them. Think about how you view them, how you understand them. Do they have more than you or less than you? Are they of the same race as you are or a different race? Are they of the same gender or a different gender? Are they older or younger? Do they have children or do they have pets? Do they live alone or with roommates? Are they like you in some ways? Are they unlike you in other ways? Perhaps the most important question to ask you about your neighbors are, do you even know who they are? Do you know anything about them at all? Maya Angelou reminds us of this. It's very important to know your next door neighbor and the people down the street and the people in another race. And I think the reason why she says this is important to be reminded of is because until we know people, we can't, sim- we can't go about the practice and the, the work of caring for them. Until we really know who they are and actually see them for who they are, see them through the lens of the image of God and the child of God, then we really can't love them and care for them the way we're supposed to. We can't practice the golden rule. If you go about every interaction and think, I want to treat this one person the way that I would like to be treated, again, not only is that impossible, it's terribly exhausting. But if you have in every interaction the same posture, this posture of, 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 of a, that person is a child of God just as much as I am. Uh, this posture of this person is loved by God just as much as I am. It will change the way you interact with everybody. It's a far more sustainable way to practice this golden rule. This is, this is why the second part, I think, of the teaching is so important. Just as we are children of God, so is everybody else. If we can learn to understand God as Father, a giver of good gifts, I think we would learn to ask for things in an audacious, wild, and sort of mind-blowing way. 
if we can learn to see ourselves as children of God, as humbling and as comforting as that is, I think it would put ourselves in a proper position and a proper place in our relationship with God. And lastly, if we can learn how to posture ourselves towards other people, believing that they are made in the image of God and loved by God in the same way that we are, I think it would dramatically change our interactions with those people. At the very end, he says, this sums up the law and the prophets. And whenever Jesus says that, what he means is this is basically the core idea to the Bible. That's what he means by that. I think that was true at the time he said it, and I think it's also true now when we now have the New Testament. I've said um, for many different times, you may have heard me say this, that there are really three things we can pull from most biblical texts. One is, who is God? What is his personality? Another is, who are we? Or what is our position toward God? And lastly, what are our interactions with other people to be? Very simply put, I think this teaching and the Bible as a whole and all of Jesus' teaching do this. It tells us God's personality, which is a giver of good gifts. It tells us our position to God, which is like a child to a father. And it tells our posture towards other people, which honestly starts with what we believe about them and what we know about them. You can't simply love something that you don't know. You can't love a person and care for a person that you don't, that you don't really understand. These are important teachings and important, an important paradigm, not just for the teachings of Jesus, but for the Bible as a whole. And I think there's a reason why Jesus puts it right towards the end of this sermon. It's such an important paradigm for us, looking back at the Sermon on the Mount, looking at any biblical text, what can this tell me about the personality of God? What can this tell me about my position to God? And what can this tell me about my posture towards other people? Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you that you are good and a giver of good gifts. That doesn't always make sense to us when we see the terrible inequities in terms of provision in the people's lives around us or maybe in our own lives. But yet we are going to cling to that promise, that truth, that you are a giver of good gifts. And I pray that our church would see you that way and interact with you that way. I pray that you would teach us about what it means to be a humble child of God. And I pray that you would teach us about what it means to posture ourselves in a way of love towards other people. We love you, and we pray these things in your name. Amen.